Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream. It's uh, April, would you believe already? The 9th of April, 2024. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on the stream tonight. And it's just me this evening. We're going to be talking specifically about all the data that I've been running the last few weeks, specifically around households and how they're performing. And this is actually a very important conversation, of course. So a deep dive on postcodes, a feeling the pinch is the title for the show. But I will say that we're going to touch on a lot of other issues too, not least because there's a lot of news out and about at the moment. And we'll try and touch on some of those. Uh, Cookie's been uh, very prolific. So thanks, Cookie, for the, all the input is greatly received. Let me just remind you uh, before we start, though, that we don't provide specific financial advice on the channel here. This is a general conversation only. Uh, do play nice in the chat room, but feel free to throw your comments and questions in. Um, we do moderate the stream as well, by the way. And uh, as of the 9th of April, as I said, if you would like to ask a question and uh, if you'd like to make a particular point to me, if you use that what the world, that then goes into my separate queue, which means there's a greater chance of me seeing it and handling it appropriately. So I don't necessarily follow everything along in the chat because there's just so much going on. But uh, nevertheless, uh, if you want to use Outward the World, that's the best way to get my attention. Also, I have enabled Super Chat, which means that if you want to get your question to the top of the list, you can do that or indeed make a contribution to what we do around here. Always greatly appreciate the Super Chats that we get. It's uh, really helpful just in terms of helping to cover the cost of what we do here. We don't do this for profit. We do this because we think there's a really important conversation to be had with regard to what's going on at the moment. So let's get on with the show. And uh, I guess the um, topic for today is predominantly my analysis down at the postcode level, but there is a lot of useful information that's come out and I want to just cover some of that. And I'll also just point you to these particular shows because this is the third in a series on feeling the pinch. About a week ago, I released who is really feeling the pinch which is a deep dive on all analysis and specifically on my method. So if you want to know more about how we do what we do, go check that out. And then the other day, I produced a show called Mapping the Pinch. And that's where I went through and showed the mapping detail. So if you want to add a look at uh, mortgage stress, rental stress, financial stress, or even defaults or uh, net investment yields, those shows are about, that show is available with that information. But today, uh, I wanted to cover some of the highlights of the headlines, and uh, there's some really important stuff out there. And I guess the first one we should refer to is the RBA. So on the 4th of April, they published a consultation on the future system for monetary policy implementation in Australia, and there's a consultation paper to guide the consultation process. The submission closes on Friday the 10th of May. Now, it's worth reading this because there's a lot of change prospectively being spoken about. And essentially what it's trying to do is to free up the Reserve Bank's capital and also to have more influence on the banking system by using less capital. And Essentially, there's some background there in terms of people have been talking about how to do that. And the changes are really because of the fact that the term funding facility is rolling off. And so they've endorsed the adoption of what's called an ample reserve system. And so the idea is that they're going to be able to use a small amount of capital in the system to be able to steer it, but potentially more frequently. And uh, I'll make a separate show on this later because I think this is a really important change. It's not a good change necessarily, but it, what it does mean is that the central bank can use less capital but have more influence on the banks and the rates that the banks might be actually charging. But it also gives more movement in those rates too, so it's worth watching that. Now let's look at the home price information. This is from PropTrack because the moves... By the way, this is a bit different from what CoreLogic said, so it's worth comparing the two, and it's just behind it, making the point that you can make up a lot of numbers or at least use different methodologies to come up with different numbers with regard to home prices. But you can see here that uh, 
clearly annual growth in Perth up 18%, in contrast to Hobart, annual growth down 1.65%. Melbourne, more significantly, is hardly moving. And in fact, uh, other data points suggest even the monthly growth was flat, whereas Sydney's higher. Queensland's up, Adelaide is strong. So it shows you that there's a very significant shift between different uh, locations with what are going on. And of course, the problem with these highlights is that they're averaging and it doesn't really tell you too much at all, but it's quite interesting. Now, I always in I'm interested in what uh, Shane Oliver over at AMP comes up with because he publishes regular newsletters on his analysis, and this is one that came out uh, very recently. And this chart is quite relevant, right? Because it's showing you the ratio of home prices to wages and incomes. And guess what? The ratio of average home prices to the average annual wages has gone through the roof. And the ratio of home prices to median disposable income is also a lot higher. And of course, this is precisely the root cause of the problem and why my analysis with regard to how this is hitting real households is so critical. Because I've had a few people say, well, you know, why do you worry about household stress and um, financial pressures if in fact defaults are low and people are still paying the mortgages. And the answer is there are consequences for what's going on. And this chart gives you the lead in as to why it's a problem. What it means is that households are more leveraged, they're more in hock, they've got less available capacity to spend. And that has a broader implication on the economy, of course, because they don't spend as much on other things, which is why retail is a bit uh, dour at the moment. But also, of course, it is fundamentally based on two things, what interest rates are doing and what employment is doing. And to that end, this next chart, again from Shane, is quite interesting because it shows you that there's a relationship between interest rates and property prices, although that has rather broken in recent times. Now, we saw that prices rose when interest rates were cut, but of course, rates are now rising and prices are still going higher. So I would argue that we've broken the nexus. And the reason for that is partly because people are more leveraged. The banks are prepared to lend at higher multiples. And there is also what I call the extend and pretend going on at the moment. So there's a lot of flexing within lending rules and particularly banks helping people by extending the length of the mortgage or going interest only. All of those things are enabling more people to effectively muddle through. Plus, of course, we have massive demand because of high migration. We'll come on to that shortly. But the other side of the story is this. This is actually from Roy Morgan. And of course, the unemployment rate uh, officially from the ABS dropped a little, surprisingly. And uh, Roy Morgan also highlighted that their real unemployment rate was down the slightly. But they make the point that there has been a big increase in underemployment. So these are people, part-time employees, who would like to work more hours but can't. And that's part of the problem. So what we're seeing in our surveys is a lot of people are not able to work more hours to be able to cover the costs of the mortgages that are coming through. So that is, of course, a critical factor. And I would argue that the way that the unemployment statistics are being presented at the moment, they're not really very accurate. Um, I think there's quite a lot of um, noise in the information. And uh, as Cookie Boy also said, some people are doing two to three jobs, part-time jobs, spreading around, all of those things. And uh, the bottom line, of course, is that the real story with regard to employment is quite significantly masked. And in fact, by the way, this is an issue that's not just in Australia, but we see it in other places too, where the old ways of measuring unemployment don't seem to work anymore. And I think the Roy Morgan method is probably a closer. The other factor, of course, and again, Shane highlights this, is that the construction starts is uh, way down. We have massive migration. And so essentially the problem we have is we have an undersupply of new properties. So all of those factors are helping to drive prices higher relative to incomes and is putting more pressure on households. And, and that's really the core point of this pre presentation. I want to delve into what the pressures are on households and how it's working through. Just uh, a couple of the contexts, though. It's worth just making the point the IMF came out with this, and Cookie, thanks for this. You um, really are helpful here. With um, the IMF saying that uh, actually Australian households 
are more leveraged because, of course, we have more variable rate lo loans and we have more in the way of debt, very low fair share of fixed rate. And so they're arguing that's one reason why the significant uh, rises that we've had are lower than other some countries. And uh, it, OK, it's been the most aggressive monetary policy since the 1980s, but our rates are still quite a lot lower if you compare Europe and Canada 5% plus, 5.25% in Britain and 5.5% in New Zealand. But in Australia, it's lower. Now, I would argue that that's true, but it's not necessarily appropriate. I would argue that it well may well be that, in fact, inflation is reigning and will stay higher. And here's another one on the same topic. The recent levels of migration and undersupply of housing means home prices have continued to grow despite the headwinds created by the Reserve Bank's most rapid increased rate cycle in decades. Um, but countries such as Australia and Japan appear to have stronger housing channels of monetary policy transmission with low shares of fixed rate loans. And the strength of the housing market recovery in the face of high interest rates is a factor that could make the RBA reluctant to cut the cash rate later this year according to economists. And I think that's exactly right. And there's plenty of articles now. This is another one that came in recently, uh, warning that actually the issue with rate cuts is a problem and excessive savings have gone. Rents and house prices are higher, but it's hard to see a big upside surprise to economic growth in Australia, which is why people are cautious about Australia. And the question is, well, will rate cuts come? And here's another article. Doubt builds that RBA will cut rates in 2024. Investors are becoming increasingly sceptical the Reserve Bank will need to cut interest rates, um, particularly as the US reinforces expectations that borrowing costs in the world's largest economy will remain higher for longer. And if the US economy is still doing very well, the global economy is holding up well, the RBA would then wonder why would we be cutting? And others are talking about that. Even Trump's pick for potential replacement for the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, um, is saying that maybe there's no need to cut. And I did make a show the other day called Could the Bumps in the Road Turn to Potholes and Rate Rises Ahead? Worth reading that. If you want to get a bit of a read in terms of why it is that everyone's now wondering whether, in fact, the Fed will be able to cut rates this year, despite all the hopium about rate cuts from the markets, despite the fact we have an election in the US and it's down to the fact that inflation is to here. We'll have numbers, of course, later in the week from the US on inflation. And I would say that you should be watching the services inflation element X housing to really get a read on what's going on. So it could be that rate rises in the US are on the cards and bond rates have gone up. Of course, one reason why deposit rates in Australia are higher. But it's not the only story. There's another story that's worth getting to as well. And that is that if you look at things like credit cards, Credit cards in Australia are now being massively exercised and you know, headlines are now saying, well, is this sustainable? You know, people are having to use quite a lot more of credit just to get by. Seeing that in my surveys, another reason why pressure on households is important. And just on that front, it's also worth making the point that there is a really big discussion about the rental sector. Do they need to freeze rents in New South Wales, for example? Um, you know, a large number of people, voters, are actually in the rental sector. So are we going to see more political manoeuvrings to try and attract renters? And that's a very important point. Plus, of course, we've also got new legislation just brought in uh, for the buy-to-rent sectors. Again, developers getting a helping hand. Guess what? They're going to get tax cuts to be able to... Um, uh, you know, incentivize more build to rent. Now, I have to tell you that the um, build to rent sector is a real problem in my mind. And in fact, Cameron Murray and I discussed that on one of our previous shows, and he made the point that it's true quite often that the rents that are being asked from the buy to rent sector are higher. Now, it's worth saying that uh, the legislation is trying to make sure that the developers must build at least 50 dwellings. They must provide some duration in the rents there and also have to offer at least 10% of dwellings as affordable tenancies, although no definition of what affordable means. 
And that's a very important point because essentially I argue that developers, whether they're building to rent or whether they're actually building for construction more generally, are looking for more government handouts. And I would expect in the budget ahead, we're going to see more government handouts. Also, very interesting, there's been a lot of discussion on the segmentation. And this was an interesting chart that came up where people were talking about um, the down traders or the downsizers, because they're a big influence. You know, more than a million of them active at the moment in the market. And they're having a big impact, uh, as well as the uh, millennials who are now buying into the rental sector. And uh, they said that more millennials seem to be choosing to rent where they want to live, but also get a foot into the market by getting an investment property or properties. And I'll show you later that some of these younger, more affluent households with rental properties are actually getting in deep strife. And uh, by the way, we've also got this point, and again, this is from Cookie, that landlords are fleeing Melbourne, um, selling up because essentially the Sydney investors and Melbourne investors are bailing in the market due to the highest rates, rates in five years and the cost of holding property becomes untenable alongside higher interest rates. And that really takes us right back to mortgage stress and all the stuff that uh, I've been talking about. And um, just to remind everybody, that uh, mortgage stress, of course, is a methodology that I've developed. I've been running for nearly 20 years now. And uh, we use this as part of our core market model. That's the uh, model that you've seen many times if you've followed the show generally. And uh, we take the information, slice and dice it all sorts of different ways based on our surveys. And we can also run some scenarios looking ahead. Scenarios are not estimates or predictions. They're just giving you sensitivities. But essentially, we can take all this information from mortgage stress, the trajectory information, the buying and selling tensions, the migration, economic data, put in the core market model and come up with some views at a postcode level, rolled up into the region and state and all Australia level as well. And that gives us a view. So before we go on, let me just remind you that if you want a deep dive conversation with me about a particular suburb or postcode, I can do that via my one to one service. I can't go into financial advice, but I can tell you about my data. I can look at stress, the home price trend data and other things like that, all based on my modeling. And it's an hour conversation via Zoom or via phone. There is a cost involved because a lot of work to do to put together. And we're booking three to five weeks out. If you want to make appointments with me, go to the DFA blog, contact me on the blog, and we can go from there. Still quite busy with these. A lot of people trying to work out what's going on. And I would make the point that uh, Going granular and looking at the detail is really quite important because these generic price trends in Sydney or Melbourne really don't tell you very much at all. But you need to go down to the granularity of which suburb, which types of property, and that gives you much more information about what's going on. Now, in terms of stress, just for those who may not have seen it before, there are many different definitions out there of stress, you know, 30% of income or taxable income. Others use underwriting metrics of various sorts, but we define stress in cash flow terms, money in, money out. So if households have more outgoings than income, we define them as stress because they have basically to make compromises somewhere along the line. So if they have a mortgage, they're in mortgage stress. If renting, renting stress. Investors also with cash flow pressures have stress as well. So they're stressed investors, and I also aggregate it up to the total financial stress. And we look at all of those and uh, we look at it both as a percentage of households and counts. Now, in the earlier shows, I presented the counts. I will today, because I've been asked to do it, just show some of the percentage data too, because it's quite an interesting variation. But I do believe that the big numbers rule is really the way to think about this. Where are the big numbers? I think the latter is best ultimately to understand what's going on. But another way of looking at it, this is the RBA model. You know, you can go from intensity of stress on the mild side to the severe side and with budget pressures, initially moving perhaps to missing payments and then ultimately insolvency. I measure it at the left hand side and the mild side. So if there are pressures, then they are in the broadest sense under difficulty. But of course, there are things that can be done. And that leads us to a very important observation because the RBA in its uh, statement of monetary policy and the various other reports, including the financial stability report, came up with a view to say oh, there's about 175,000 mortgage holders, one in 20, that have cash flow issues. Now, that was variable rate loans only. 
and it's a very particular way that they've used. I think it's understated. Roy Morgan says it's 1.6 million. This is their most recent data. There was data in Melbourne where they said that 54% of Victorians now say they're experiencing hardship beyond normal levels. So that's uh, another significant factor. And uh, Tarek's post of Finder said 45% of people don't have $1,000 of savings. And, uh, of course, averaging is different from you know other ways of measuring it. So, again, you've got to be a little bit careful with statistics. But rising deeply concerning complaints about banks are not helped by people in hardship from the ABC recently with complaints rising by 25% according to the Australian Financial Complaints Authority or AFCA. So it's really important to understand that there is not a hard and fast rule to define what stress means, but I think the cash flow measure, which is the one I use, is the most relevant and appropriate, and that's the one I will continue to use. And then if I show you what that looks like at a high level, you can see there that the rental stress has gone through the roof once again, never been higher, 75% of households. Mortgage stress is a lot higher. Just under half of households with a mortgage have cash flow pressures compared with 32% back in February 2020 before COVID. And the RBA, of course, continues to peddle their view that, well, the debt to income ratio is not too bad, but that's all households, whether they've got a mortgage or not. And here is the quick summary for March showing that the rental stress is at 75%, which is more than 2.3 million households. That mortgage stress is at 49%, which is at 1.77 million households. And overall financial stress is at 48%, which is translating to 4.75 million households, just under half of all households in the country. So this is a big deal. And one of the things I keep coming back to is the idea that the longer this goes on and the more we get to the point where households are going to struggle, the more likely it is that we're going to see mortgage arrears rising. Now, mortgage arrears at the moment are not particularly high, although they are higher than they have been. And of course, if you compare what's happening in Australia over the last 20, 30 years, it's very different from the US where they went through the roof more than 8% in the US nearly 4% in the UK, Australia a lot lower, although, again, there were extends and pretends and other circumstances. But the headline news is now that mortgage delinquencies are actually reaching a fastest pace in the last two years. Western Australia is where a lot of the issues are. And in fact, this data, which I have from my surveys, shows where some of those delinquency rates are at the highest, by sorted by the count of households under pressure more likely to default in the next 12 months. And you can see there that places like Cranbourne or Roxburgh Park or Tarnit in Victoria or Derrimont and Point Cook, they're all high growth corridors, a lot of new people coming into the country, a lot of people with new mortgages and first time buyers. We've also got the Western Australia, places like Success um, stands out there, Samson, of course, Mount Claremont, and of course, Mandra in Western Australia with still significant levels of default. And then we've got the mid-court north coast like Gosford, regional areas like Toowoomba and Bundaberg. So you can see here that wherever you look, there is some rather worrying trends. Now, this is a projection based on what I think is likely to happen, based on where I think interest rates are going to go. And that takes us nicely to our scenarios. Our scenarios, as I've said before, is a way of thinking about sensitivity. It's not trying to make absolute estimates. They're talking about different futures. They're looking forward from today. And there are the three, the Goldilocks zone, where you see mortgage rates roughly stay where they are because the RBA keeps cash rates in hold, maybe until late 2024. Inflation eases ahead of RBA expectations. Wages continue to rise a little faster. We don't get a recession. Migration remains strongly above where we were. The base case will be a soft landing where the rates stay higher through 2024. Inflation falls, but then rises again and stays above target to 25. No recession in Australia. Migration falls a little closer to averages. Or the worst case scenario, the nightmare scenario, where you see rate rises above 4.35%, lifting mortgage rates. Stays high through 24. Inflation stays suddenly high. Unemployment starts to move. Wages growth stalls because we get recessionary forces here locally. And rates then fall later 
but it's a bit too late. Migration falls significantly more. Now you could run other different scenarios, and you know these are just ones trying to show you some of the sensitivities, and it can give you a bit of a flavour of what this means. Here is the WA story. So over the next three years, this is some. Um, looking at the best case for houses, we could see a rise of, say, 25% over three years in the best case scenario. The base case is more like 6.2%, but the worst case is a fall of 14% over three years. But in those first two scenarios, certainly prices higher over the next 12 months. Units moving in a somewhat similar direction, but not quite so aggressively up or down. And just to give you a comparison between that and Tasmania, where in the best case scenario, there might be a very slight rise in prices over three years for houses, but more likely a fall or a more significant fall and units roughly following, maybe not falling quite as much. Now, the reason I'm showing you these is to try and give you a sense that there is a logic behind where things might be going, but it's not making predictions. It's trying to just get you a sense of where some of those movements are likely to be. If you want to look at more sensitivities or indeed look at those top postcodes, which are listed in the earlier presentation, then check it out, as I said. Because what I want to do now is to move the conversation further forward and begin to move into the next start of the show. And there are two things I want to do. The first thing I want to do is switch across and show you some of the critical issues that we're seeing with regard to mortgage stress, but in percentage terms. So to do that, I'm going to bring this slide up. So this is actually the Sydney story of mortgage stress and households in mortgage stress, but in percentage terms. And uh, you can see here in the blue, it's 8% or below. Um, when you get into the yellows, it's between 59 and 74 percent, and then the darker colours at 90. Now, what you can see immediately is that there are quite a few households in more affluent areas where they do have some significant issues. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to default, but what it means is they have cash flow pressures. It's also true if you look around Strathfield or Ashbury or Chester Hill, and I also think, interestingly, Cremorne Point and Manly. Now, the thing about a lot of these areas is the house prices are very extended, so people have extended themselves quite often to get in. Now, if you pull out and have a look at this more broadly, you can start to see that as you go to the west, again, a lot of households in these western suburbs, from Fairfield, from places like Campbelltown, beyond Blacktown, and uh, up to the north as well, some in and around Ride, and uh, even down towards Wollongong. So it's quite interesting when you take a look at this. It shows you where those percentages are quite high. Now, is that relevant? Well, not necessarily so, because, of course, in some cases, those postcodes are relatively limited in terms of the count of postcodes, households in those postcodes. Now, if I were to go to Melbourne and just do a similar thing to show you comparison. So from the centre of Melbourne, again, looking at the percentages, you can see there that there are some areas close into Melbourne, like the North Melbourne, Hawthorne, Stonington. And as you pull out, you can start to see that there's a growing trend of suburbs around the Northern Ringe, Ess Fringe, Essendon, for example, Pasco Vale, places like that. And as you pull out, you can see down towards Casey, all those areas there, as you perhaps expect, and uh, further afield too. So it does show you that there is a somewhat strong correlation between percentages and the numbers, as I displayed in my earlier presentations. But you can see Ballarat's there again, so another, another example. I'll just show you uh, one other. Let's go across to the west and go to Perth. And in Perth, Again, towards the centre of Perth, there's not a lot going on. But as you pull out, you start to see that there are high percentages of households with some cash flow pressures. And those cash flow pressures, of course, convert ultimately into decisions about what I spend money on or not spend money on, and ultimately possibly even defaults. And you can see here the coastal areas where there's a lot up there. Um, south of Perth too, and as we pull out even more, down to places like Rockingham, you can see that there are areas there as well. So that's the story with regard to mortgage stress. Now I can also do the same by switching across 
to rental stress. And in fact, rental stress load it is really interesting. If you look in Sydney, you can see how much more of rental stress is sitting in those inner suburban areas. So whether you look um, you know to the coast or to the south, St. Peter's to the north, Roseville to Ryde, or to the west out to Fort Fairfield and beyond. And as I pull out, you can see that rental stress is really quite concentrated, much more concentrated closer in relative to mortgage stress. So rental stress is a big factor more broadly across Sydney and its surrounds. And if we look in Melbourne, we can see a quite similar thing. Again, close in, it's maybe not too bad. Although in the yellows, it's still, you know, quite high, 78 to 86 percent. But further out, you can see that there are more red areas. And in fact, there are whole swathes, particularly out around here, you know, up towards the east, as well as Geelong, places like that, where rental stress is a problem. So it's quite important to understand how different different locations are but with these higher levels of mortgage stress even close in and around melbourne it's not surprising that some of those melbourne investors are looking to quit and i will just go this time to brisbane and show you the similar story there because again there's a level of mortgage stress as well as rental stress. And rental stress is significant here because you can see close into the center of town, there are quite a few people, quite a few people who are in difficulty. Now the population density is low in Brisbane. So maybe you'd expect to see more yellows rather than reds and oranges. But as you full out, you can also see that in some of those other areas, there are very significant pressures on many areas and many households. And this is going to explain i think some of the pressures on the rental sector really shouting quite strongly now which is why i said earlier on my expectation is that the politicians will want to try and do something to help renters i would expect more help in the budget ahead because the rental pressures on many are absolutely profound now so with that as an introduction what i can now do is start looking at the details in my model at the postcode level. And I'm going to start by showing you this example, because this is my pet example, my Wollongong example. And also, for those who have not seen on the show before, this is the mechanism that I use to report all the information from my surveys. So you can see a few things. We start with the household counts, 18,000, split down between those who own their properties outright, those borrowing, those renting. Also the investment property count in the area. We've got the stress metrics, mortgage and rental stress, investor stress, and overall financial stress. We've got the property mix. Are they houses or units or other types of property? That could be, for example, over retail. We've got the people ratio. So this is how many people per household, and if it's low, then it's singles, if it's higher, then it's families or couples. We've got investment information, both gross and net investment yield. This is all updated to the end of March, as you can see here. We've got the taxable income from both the ATO and from the census, individual from the ATO, the household from the census. We calculate the disposable monthly income, and that then gives a proportion that is going on the average rent or the average mortgage. And we've also got some scenarios in terms of home price movements, as you can see here. And uh, we've shown them in the chart, and we show the cumulative here as well, which shows that in the best case scenario, a 12.1% rise for houses and a 10.3% rise for units, but a 28% drop or a 24% drop possible if we get the worst case scenario that I discussed previously. So that's the mechanism that we use. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to check back into the chat and uh, have a look and see where there are particular postcodes that people would like me to dive into. 
and I'm going to go up and see what I can find. And uh, I see that uh, Bloom Bloom came in quite early, postcode 3012. Let's have a look at that one, shall we? OK, so this is West Footscray. And I'm just going to take the chat off now so that you can see the entire presentation. So 11,000 households, 21% earning outright, 36% borrowing, but 41% renting. So this is renters uh, very much to the fore. We have 38% in mortgage stress, but a very high proportion in rental stress. As I've explained before, I think, you know, when I want to say 100%, it could be plus or minus a few percent because uh, of the grossing up from the uh, sample. We use a 0.5% sample, which is 52,000 households. So there's a bit of latitude, but it's high. You can see there that there's 55% houses, 70% units, and 27% other types of property, including over retail. And you can also see the people ratio is quite high, 2.15%. So that just tells me it's families as well as individuals. There was quite a high vacancy rate. Now, that was when the census was done. And of course, that was uh, through the end of COVID. So it may be a little artificial, maybe less students than normal in the area. Gross investment yield is 3.1%, and that's positive. That's, of course, the relationship between the price of the property and the theoretical rental that people can obtain in this postcode. But the net investment yield is underwater, minus 0.1%. That perhaps explains why we've got a quarter of stressed investors. If you put the net investment yield and the stressed renters together, you can perhaps explain why. And the overall scenario would say that the price movements, in the best case scenario, there's not much growth, even in the best case scenario, more significant falls, both the units and houses. Looking at the disposable income, well, the ATO said 77,000 on an individual, 103,000 average household. That would suggest that we've got more than one income going on the mortgage. And that will translate to an average disposal of around $6,800 with 36 0.8% going on the typical mortgage, $2,500, and 26.9% at $1,843 going on the typical rent. So this is an area of significant pressure at the moment. <laughs> and uh, Hammers uh, said, you're a video producing machine, Martin. Well, I try to, I try to produce fair old video, but hopefully of reasonable standards as well, because of course, quality and quantity need to run in the same direction. Now, drum bass asked 3064. Let's put that one in and see what we get. So this is Roxburgh Park in Melbourne with 34,400 households, with 13% owning outright, 59% of borrowing, and 26% of renting. So this is, again, mortgage city here. 46% are in mortgage stress. That's more than 9,400 households. We've got 72% of renters in rental stress. Some investor stress, but not particularly high. The overall financial stress for households just over 50%. Mostly houses. And you can see here the people ratio is very high, 3.19. This is a family. This is very significant proportions of families. The vacancy rates low at about 5% compared to what we saw previously. And the gross investment yields 3.1%. Net investment yield is minus 0.7%. And if you look at the income, the ATO has said 65,000. The household census said 94,000. So once again, you can see multiple household members contributing to income. Disposable monthly income on average in this postcode is about $5,600, with 40% going on the typical mortgage, $2,200, and 33%, $1,899 going on the typical rent. And looking at the scenarios, well, on the best case scenario, there is a small rise potentially for houses and units, best case scenario, but the base or worst case scenario would suggest a bit of a fall ahead. <laughs> Alyssa asked for postcode 4305, which I can put that in. Um, no, I don't have... A <laughs> I don't have chickens in the backyard, I must say. Imagine the dogs with the chickens. It would be absolute mayhem. Um, 4305 is Basin Pocket, helping the Ipswich area. I'm going to take uh, a 
comment off there. Okay. So in this particular postcode, we have 25,000 households. We have 25% borrowing out, uh, owning outright, 34% borrowing, a lot renting, 40%. High levels of stress, 68% of mortgage stress, 89% in rental stress, some stressed investors. So the overall financial stress metric is 62%, which is pretty high. In terms of property mix, 86% are houses. There are some units and the types of property there. The people ratio is on the high side. So this is not just individuals, this includes some families. The vacancy rate was 6.7% in the census. Gross investment yields 4.2 positive, and interestingly, the net investment yield is positive 0.1. The net investment yields in the Queensland region are a little bit higher, so they tend to be a little bit more attractive. And that's one of the reasons why people are selling up in Sydney and Melbourne and looking to invest in Queensland or uh, Adelaide or indeed Western Australia. Taxable income 67,000 compared with 73,000 for the household census which gives a disposable monthly around $4,900 with 33% of disposable income going on the average rent, 1664, or 30% going on the average, sorry, average mortgage, I should say, and 30% going on the average rent at 1495 From a scenario perspective, because of the supply-demand disequilibrium up there, 11% possible rise in prices, best case over three years, for houses, a bit less for units, but the base case or the worst case would give us a fall in properties. Now, Samuel says four, five, six, five, please. Oops, four, five, six, five. And uh, you can see there that uh, that is to Winton, actually, another little place. My very nice um, shop there that I went through years ago and got some interesting furniture, which I still have. Okay, um, 6,000 households, 43% earning outright, 32% borrowing, 23% renting, 70% in mortgage stress, 72% in rental stress, and some investor stress, overall financial stress at 41% a bit lower than what we saw previously. Obviously, this is in the Noosa area, just inland. And 85% of houses, small number of units and other types of property. The people ratio, 2.12, is again on the high side. So that'll include some households with families. The vacancy rate was somewhat higher. That could well be some Airbnb and holiday accommodation in the area at the time when the census was run. The gross investment yield is 4.2. Net investment yield is flat at zero. The income is 66,000, no, almost no difference between the census and the ATO, giving an average disposal of around $4,400 with 49% going on the average mortgage. That's one of the highest ones we've seen, $2,200, or 48%, 2,193 going on the typical rent. From a scenario perspective, best case scenario, there's still upward movement in prices, 14% over three years. For houses and units, small number of units, of course, but 12.6% or so. The base case and worst case, a bit of a fall. All right, let's see what other questions we have. Bossman said 4510. This is Kabulcha. And we've got 20,000 households, 26% earning outright, 35% are borrowing, and 38% are renting. We've got mortgage stress at 11%, pretty low, but 90% in rental stress. Some investor stress too, so 46% is the overall stress metrics. And 83% are houses, some units, and other types of property. The people ratio is 2.43. And the vacancy rate was 6.9%. Gross investment yields 4.7%. Net investment yields 0.9%. The taxable income 62 versus 68. And disposal monthly around 4,400 with 43% going on the mortgage at $1,900 and 20, 36% going on the average rent at 1619. From a scenario perspective, still potential growth 16% over three years in the best case for houses and 14% for units. Base case, a bit of a fall. The worst case, a more significant fall. Let's 
Scott asked for 4161. A lot of Queensland ones to get night. 4161. Which is Alexandra Hills. And Alexandra Hills is in the east of Brisbane. 6,000 households. 28% are only outright. 49% are borrowing. A lot of borrowing households. 22% are renting. 84% in mortgage stress. 76% in rental stress, a bit of investor stress, and households in financial stress quite high up for 61% overall. 93% of houses, small number of units, and the types of property. The people ratio, again, is quite high, so that's going to be more than just individuals. 4.35% vagues rate a bit lower. Net investment yield is 0.8, gross investment yields 4.4. And looking at the taxable income, the individual from the ATO was 69,000, but the household average was 95,000 and that translates to a disposal monthly of just over 6,000 with 35% going on the typical mortgage at $2,100 and 32% $1,900 going on the typical rent. From a house price scenario 12% potential rise best case for houses 10% for units a bit of a fall in the base and worst case scenarios. Silverback says 2158. Yep, can do that. So here we're talking about uh, in the Aus Hornsby area, Doral, Wiseman Ferry, that sort of area. It's a pretty small count at 2,900. I'm just going to take a sip of water, excuse me a second. Forty-seven percent are outright, thirty-eight percent are borrowing, and eighteen and fourteen percent are renting. There's no data on the stress; probably not a lot there. Eighty-two percent are houses, small number of other types there as well, and um, maybe even some on the water. I don't know. People, the vacancy rates. Sorry, the vacancy rates are five point eight percent. The people ratio is two point eight seven percent. The gross investment yield is 3.4, but net investment yield is underwater by 1%. The data on income, 138,000 versus 132,000, so pretty similar. That translates to a disposal monthly around 6,500, which gives a very high 56% going on the typical mortgage at 3,689 and 45% going on the typical rent at 2,990. And I'll make two observations. Firstly, with a small sample. You know, it's a bit of variation in terms of accuracy, but also quite a lot of this is explained by the higher taxable income because those with higher incomes have more flexibility in managing significantly higher proportions of their income to make their payments without falling over. Now, Steve asked for Balgari. I need you to put... Oh, yeah, you did. 2519. Thank you. Um I don't have the search tool up at the same time as I do this. I oh, know, 2519. Uh, he's not Bulgari. Oh, it is. It is, sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Of course, I read Fairy Merida. I hope, hope that uh, people in that area have not been too washed away with the floods and things recently. Pretty disastrous. Okay, nearly 7,000 households with 2,800 only outright, 1,900 borrowing and 2,000 renting. The rental stress is 36%. The invest that the rent <laughs> the mortgage stress is 36%. The rental stress is 77%, and the stressed invest is at 29%, giving a total financial stress reading of 42%. There's a lot of houses, 68%, but also some other types of property, including units, 11% and other types of property there. Again, the people ratio shows that it's families as well as individuals. Vacancy rates at five. That could be some Airbnb, possibly in the area too. Gross investment yield is 3.4. Net investment yield is underwater, minus 0.5. Looking at the taxable income, 83,000 versus 87,000, so it's pretty close, giving a disposal monthly of around 5,500, with 48% going on the typical mortgage at 2688 and the typical rent at 35% or 1993. And looking at the scenarios, price rises in the best case scenario are still there at 13% for houses and 11% for units. But the base case and worst case would show a potential fall. Do 
joining the queue. Thank you for the que queuing up. I appreciate that. And you've asked for 4509. And sure, we can do that. OK, 4509 is North Lakes, as you say. Get rid of that so you can see it all. And here we've got uh, 13,000 households with 14% owning outright, 43% borrowing and 41% renting. We've got stress at 70% for mortgages, but 74% for renting. We've got 79% houses, some other types of property as well. The people ratio is quite high at 2.81. So again, it's families as well as individuals. The vacancy rates at 4.4%. Gross investment yields 4.6%. Net investment yields 0.5%. The taxable income. The ATO said 75,000. The census said 109,000. So more than one income going on the average mortgage. And looking at the disposal monthly income, 6,600, which gives 36% going on the typical mortgage at 2398 or 30 percent at just over two thousand dollars a month going on the typical rent and the prices well scenarios would say best case still further rises 17 percent for houses 15 percent for units over three years the base case is just a little fall and the worst case a more significant fall Rob Hay asked for 3114. Now this is Park Orchards in Melbourne, and as you say, doing somewhat better. Now, caveat, of course, this area is a low count. So when I get into the low count areas, I need to caveat this by saying that it is not necessarily 100% accurate. So I do my best, but you can see I don't have much in the way of stress data here which means that uh, the price scenarios could be a little bit uh, overstated. Anyway, let's go through it quickly. Just 1,200 with mostly only outright or borrowing, very few renting in the area. And there isn't really much in the way of stress indicated. Mostly houses in the area. People ratio is quite high, so that'll be families as well as individuals. The vacancy rate at 4.9%. And the gross investment yields 4.2, net investment yield positive 1.1. So you're dead right. From an investment perspective, this particular area looks more positive than many within the locales around Melbourne. If we look at the taxable income, 120,000 versus 164,000. So you can see there that households are putting more than one income into the uh, mortgage potentially. GAFS gives a disposal monthly of 8,400 with 42% going on the mortgage at 3,635% going on the rent at 2,900. But again, because of the higher gross incomes, there's more money to play with. So the stress levels are relatively low. And I do find this quite often. The most stressed areas are where the average incomes are quite a lot lower. From a scenario perspective, significant growth in the best case scenario, up 18% or 16% for units. Houses uh, on the base cases, you know, flat or thereabouts over three years. Same for units, but a fall if things go a bit pear shaped. Another question coming in. This is from um, asking for Lindisfarne in 7015. We'll see if we can get that one in. OK, so this is. Um, in the northeast of Hobart, for those who don't know where Lindisfarne is, I have to say that I was one of them. But uh, very nice sounding area anyway. 4,800 households here, 42% own outright, 36% of borrowing, small number of renting at 21%. Stress is quite high at 70% for the mortgage stress, 92% for the rental stress. Bit of stressed investor stuff as well, but financial stress above 48% there. It's mostly houses, small number of units, but it's mostly houses. People ratio is 2.1, so probably quite a few couples and maybe some families there too. Vexy rate at 5.9%. Possibly that includes some, some Airbnb or something, who knows? 4.8% is the gross investment yield. Net investment yield is positive 0.6%. The ATO report is 74,000 average taxable income. The census said 82,000, giving a disposal monthly around $5,400 with 35% go on the average mortgage at 1,950 or 36%, 1,990 going on the average rent. 
And from a scenario perspective, even in the best case scenario, because of the stress levels that we're seeing and the trajectory in Tasmania, I'm thinking that even the best case scenario is there could be a small fall in prices over the next three years and a more significant fall if the scenarios are more aggressively negative. Now, Bossman said 4715. Now, this is in the area of Fitzroy and it includes Castle Creek and a few other areas and Dungree and um, Bilio, Bilo, I can't say it, Biloella. I don't know how you'd say that. That's going to, uh, that's why I'm claiming that that's the way I'm going to say it tonight anyway. So I apologize for the, any mispronunciation. <clears throat> okay, just 2,500 households with 28% adding outright, 34% borrowing, and 36% are renting. The stress is 31% on mortgage stress, 63% on rental stress, some investor stress, and the overall financial stress is 40%. The properties are 90% houses, small number of units and other types. The people ratio is 2.14, so maybe some singles, some couples, some families. But high, high vacancy rates are 14.8%, so this could well possibly be uh, an area where there are other students or Airbnb or something like that there. 4.7% gross investment yield, 1.1% net investment yield. Average taxable, 85,000. Census said 99,000. That gives a disposal monthly around 6,200 with 26.8% going on the mortgage or 20% going on the average rent. And scenarios, both the best and base shows a positive lift to prices over the next three years. The worst case will be a bit of a fall. Anthony said, can I fit in Lakemba? 2195. Sure can. Okay, Lakemba. Of course, in the Canterbury area of Sydney. 8,400 with 19% owning outright, 20% borrowing, 59% renting. The rental stress is at 38%. The, sorry, the mortgage stress is at 38%. The rental stress is at 90%. Stressed investors, 49%. Overall financial stress, pretty high. If I look at the houses, 26%. Units, 68%. Small number of the types of property. People ratio is 2.8, so that'll be some families as well as individuals. But the ratings rate was 9.5, which was quite high. 3.2% gross investment yield, net investment yield minus 0.5%. And looking at the taxable, 57,000 versus 64,000. And that translates to a disposal monthly of around 4,400 with 45% going on the typical mortgage at just over $2,000. And 39% going on the typical rent at $1,700. And... I'd also make the point that the scenarios suggest a rise in property in the best case scenario over three years, maybe 8% for houses, slightly less for units. But the base case and the worst case would signal possibly falls. Silverback said 2199. All right, so this is in the Bankstone area and it's Yaguna. 6,000 households, 28% owning outright, 32% of borrowing, 39% of renting. We have 32% in mortgage stress, 91% in rental stress. Not much stressed investors at 26%, but overall financial stress, just above 50. We have 64% of houses, 19% units, and then some other types of property too. People ratio is three, so that probably includes some families. Six times. 2% vacancy rate, and the gross investment yield is 3.3. The net investment yield is minus 0.8%. Taxable income was 65,000 or 74,000 from the census, giving a disposal monthly around 4,700, with 54% each going on the mortgage, which is over $2,600, and 42%, $1,993 going on the typical rent. And looking at the scenarios, Positive, in the best case scenario, 11 or 10 for houses and units. Bit of a fall for the base and a significant fall for the worst case scenario. 
Okay, Jack has asked for a Tasmanian postcode 7177. And this is Dun Alley down on the southeast coast of Tasmania. It's an extremely low count. So I must warn you that this is you know, subject to who knows. Um, some mortgage stress, potentially. You can see there that you've got quite a few earning outright at 53. Some are borrowing, 33. Some are renting but it's pretty low and as with all of these things with the low counts you've got to take this with a big pinch of salt a lot of houses 78 percent a few other types of property in the area people ratio somewhat low probably some individuals there as well as uh, maybe some couples and families the vacancy rate was very high this could also be airbnb territory 4.6 percent versus a net investment yield of minus 0.5 Taxable was 62 versus 65 for the household census. That gives a disposed monthly of just over 3,100, sorry, 3,900. And a third going on the mortgage, or a third, 39% actually going on the typical rent. From a scenario perspective, best case scenario, there's still potential rises, 13% or 11% for houses and units, but the falls are quite significant if we get the worst case scenario coming through. Okay. Okay, Nathan said Canning Vale 61655. Finally, we get to WA. This is in the southwest of Perth around Melville and has 17,000 households there with 34% earning outright, 47% of borrowing, 18% of renting. And that gives us a stress level of 37%, a rental stress of 66%, and stressed investor 25% with 36% in financial stress. You can see there that the majority of property is houses, small number of units and other types. People ratio is 2.94, so that's going to be a lot of families as well as individuals. The vacancy rate's low at 4%. Gross investment yields 3.9, net investment yield positive 0.1. The taxable income was 82,000 from the ATO, 116,000 from the census, so that's more than one income going to help pay the mortgage, giving a disposal monthly around $6,400, with 37% going on the typical mortgage, $2,400, and 32%, which is over $2,000 going on the typical rent. And the scenarios are pretty strong in terms of price movements, with a 22% rise over three years for the best case scenario for houses, a bit less for units. Base case, still positive but the worst case, a bit of a fall over three years. Okay, Jerry made a super chat. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jerry. I really appreciate that uh, contribution to what we do around here. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And then Jerry said, are you able to do 4121? Well, guess what? Yes, of course. So this is, make sure I've got the right one, 421 Mount Gravit, 4121. I don't see it on the list of suburbs, but I'll do this one anyway, since I've got it up. And let me know if it is the right one or whether in fact there's a different postcode. Okay, so here we have 9,800 households. We have 27% borrowing out, own outright, 43% borrowing, 29% are renting. We have 84% as houses, 11% units, smaller or other types. We have stress at 36% for mortgage stress and 74% for rental stress, a bit of investor stress, and overall households in financial stress at 43%. We have a people ratio of 2.55%, so that's going to be families as well as individuals. We have 4.5% gross investment yield, 0.7% net investment yield. We have a taxable income of 97,000 or the household census, 127,000. So again, more than one income going on the typical mortgage, giving a disposal monthly of around $7,400 with 38% going on the typical mortgage, $2,800 and 27%, just over $2,000 going on the typical rent. And looking at the scenarios, positive, 
in the best case scenario for houses up 16% over three years, units a little less so, the base case down 2% or 2.1%, and worst case and more significant fall. Okay, let me go to this postcode next. Pete asks for 2261. Okay, 2261 is Batu Bay in the central coast. 22,000 households, 34% earning outright, 35% borrowing, and 30% renting. We have mortgage stress at 38%. We have rental stress at 86%. We have some stressed investors, and we also have some financial stress at 48%. 73 percent of houses, we have some units and other types of property in the area. Or people ratio of just over two. That could be some individuals as well as couples and families. High vacancy rate, possibly Airbnb in that area, or second homes. Gross investment yield is 3.5%. Net investment yield is minus 0.3%. The taxable income was 71 versus 75,000 from the ATO versus the census, giving a disposal monthly around 4,700, with 51% going on the typical mortgage at 2,400, or 40% of 1,918 going on the typical rent. From a scenario perspective, best case scenario, a rise of 11% over three years for the houses, or 9.6% for units, but the base case and the worst case would be a fall. Now, let me just come back to this particular question. Thank you for looking up Linda's farm. Quick question. How do you measure stressed investor location? Is it the location of the investor or the location of the investment property? Well, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to get a sense of everything that's going on in that particular postcode. So it is actually the stress of the renter in that postcode, in some cases, of course, the investor is living in the same postcode, but the investor could be living somewhere else. I do have a separate metric, which I haven't showed, where I actually calculate it based on where the investor is rather than where the property is. But to make this modeling work at the moment, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the renter and then, if you like, the yin and the yang of the investor and the renter in that one. So I hope that explains it. And uh, Drew said, hi Drew, nice to see you. I'm a late chat. I need a smooth operator, little boys. <laughs> Good to see you anyway. And uh, just to acknowledge uh, that uh, that was your third super on the live stream. So I really appreciate it, by the way. Thank you very much for making the super chat contribution. All right, so how are we doing? I think probably I've caught up, which is good, given where we are. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back and uh, talk a little bit more about some of the other things that I have going on in my presentation. And uh, that will take us quite nicely to the end of the show, hopefully. So to do that, I first need to switch across to here. OK, and then I need to move the presentation forward. on. I need an extra mouse, which I don't have. OK, so let me just talk a little bit. Why well, is it not working? Should do. Yeah. Let me just talk a little bit about the problem that I see and what people can do about it, because um, there is a lot of pressure on households that I see at the moment. And I'm quite interested that still a lot of people are holding on to the view that there is going to be a get out of jail card and that get out, get out of jail card will be essentially the rate cuts. Now, I've argued earlier on for various reasons, I think it's quite unlikely that we're going to see rate cuts anytime soon. So it's very important that households sort of get their arms around their own financial situation. Now, one of the things that I think is quite important is reaching for help when you need it. And I have unfortunately come across quite a few people who've actually Googled for help with financial advice or help with debt management. And unfortunately, you often end up paying for that 
for stuff that you shouldn't have to pay for. That's why I always recommend the National Debt Helpline, 1-800-007-007. This is a government-backed uh, scheme, of course. And this particular scheme is a very good source of help. So if you are in difficulty, then it is quite important that you actually get help and get help from the right people. But it is also very important to be able to develop your own picture as to how your household finances are flowing. And I still am concerned that only half of households in my surveys really have their arms around their finances, which means knowing where the money's coming in and where it's going out. And that's all despite all the online tools and everything else that, that's available. Now, in some cases, I think that uh, my surveys show me that people don't really want to know. They put their head in the sand and hope that things will magically cure themselves. I think that's quite unlikely. In some cases, of course, if you have a mortgage, you can also directly reach for the banks. They have a hardship scheme and are obliged to help, legally speaking. However, some of the solutions they'll come up with, like extending the term of the mortgage or going interest only or having payment holidays, are not necessarily always good from the point of view of the borrower. It's more from the point of view of the bank itself, because if the bank can keep you out of being in default mode, that means you don't have to report defaults. And that's one of the main reasons why defaults are pretty low at the moment across Australia. There's a lot of extending and pretending going on where mortgages are restructured. You end up paying a lot more interest, of course, over time. And uh, we've seen quite a few households who bounced onto interest-only loans and then are accumulating bigger debts down the track without any exit plan. So it might solve in the short term, but will it solve in the longer term? That's a really significant question. Now, I found this other source of quite useful help, and this is from Africa that I mentioned earlier on. They've got this statement of financial position. It's an online tool that they offer on their site. And what's nice about it, it actually goes through the sorts of steps that I do in my modelling, where I look at the household income, the living expenses, the property details, other assets, other debts, and essentially come up with a view as to how things are going along. So if you need some help, with a tool to be able to actually calculate where you are, this is quite a useful tool. And you can print it off at the end of it and then take it to a financial advisor or the bank, or whatever. But it is actually the discipline of building a cash flow and keeping it up to date so you can see where the money is coming in, where it's going out, because that then gives you the opportunity to prioritize. And the prioritize uh, means look carefully where you're spending your money. For example, if you've got debt on high interest bearing credit cards, they're the ones that probably need to be um, dealt with first. I don't think reaching for more credit, though, is a good story. And unfortunately, buy now, pay later and credit cards, personal loans or even pulling equity out of the property are all strategies being offered by the banks. And uh, that's why I mentioned the high credit card debt earlier on. The problem is, of course, quite a few people get into more difficulty. And I've spoken to quite a few debt counsellors who are really concerned about this accumulation of ever more debt as a way to get out of debt. It really doesn't work very well. And of course, the under underwriting standards at the moment are also quite generous even now, although the borrowing power is quite a lot lower. In some cases, the banks are prepared to break their own rules. So that's just worth thinking about. So it is really important to prioritise and then essentially begin to look at how you can maximise the income that you've got. Now, some people are working more hours, as I said earlier on, although some of those hours are disappearing now. And in some cases, the other story is to cut back, and people are doing that. If they've got savings, of course, they're pulling on savings in some cases. That's one of the reasons why we're seeing, seeing the savings ratio dropping quite considerably. And in fact, uh, over the last few months, the savings ratio is back down from its significantly higher levels earlier on through COVID, where people had nowhere to spend. So all of this is about trying to get your arms around your finances and going to the bank or going to get some help with an informed view. Unfortunately, quite a few people, as I say, have their head in the sand and are hoping that things are actually going to turn around. The other thing that I'm seeing is quite a few people in the rental sector are so desperate because of the rent rises that are still flowing through, and I showed you the rental stress earlier on, that they're actually looking to buy and are buying properties in poor locations 
sometimes poorly built property, sometimes actually property that needs a lot of work doing to it. And unfortunately, quite a few of these people are actually walking into another trap because not all property is equal in terms of value or potential. And so you can convert potentially a rental payment into a mortgage payment. But if you're paying that mortgage on a property that is not particularly well endowed, then you may well end up regretting it later. So I do worry that some people are being bounced from the rental sector just to buy. And that's one of the reasons why, of course, first time buyers are still buying quite strongly at the moment with the help of the parent bank or the bank of mum and dad and uh, also with big mortgages from the banks. Ask yourself this question, what happens if rates go higher, not lower? What happens if rates stay higher for another two or three years? I'm not saying it will, but it might. So these are important conversations to have. And, you know, it's about being forearmed and forewarned and also taking accountability for the income and expenditure. And I have to say that I still have in my surveys some households who blame the bank for lending them too much or blame the real estate agent for fooling them over a property. At the end of the day, you as an individual or as a family, when you buy, you know, you're making significant decisions. Sometimes those decisions don't take into account the ongoing running costs of property. So things like having to pay the council bills later on, electricity, gas, all those other things too. So there are costs involved, plus, of course, maintenance as well. Maintenance costs on properties are also significant. So if you want to know more about that, go and watch some of the shows with Edwin, where Ed and I go into this in a lot more detail. Anyway, we are getting towards the end of the show. Um, so let me now show you this next chart which is a really interesting one. And it's the one that I mentioned earlier on about asset classes. This is from Shane. And um, Shane from AMP basically shows that Australian shares and Australian property since 1926 have pretty much over that period, if you'd invested in 1926, actually performed quite similarly at around 9.8% sorry, 10.8% annually. Cash, 5.2%. Australian bonds, 6.5%. Now, that, of course, is um, full of all sorts of um, distortions, but you can see there that the shares are at 11.2%, Australian property at 10.9% over that period. Now, of course, if you'd bought in at different points in the cycle, the answer would have been different. But I guess my point is that there is some logic to say that assets will generally travel in similar directions. So those who actually argue that property magically outperforms relative to other asset classes might be kidding themselves. And also the point is that the significant growth that we had in property values were triggered significantly by those rate cuts, as I showed you in the earlier chart from Shane. Now rates are higher. And my own view is that rates will stay high for longer, but will come down a little. So there is no guarantee necessarily that the asset value in property is going to be the same in the years ahead relative to where you've been from. Particularly if migration is turned down and interest rates stay high. So that's one of the reasons why my scenarios shake out the way they do. So I hope you found that uh, pretty insightful. Um, Cookie Boy says, so many more are resorting to credit cards and guess what the bank is going to do with credit card interest rate. Well, they put them up actually. They've also reduced CBA, I noticed some of its credit cards, they've reduced the interest-free days on their credit card recently. So it's worth checking quite considerably. And <laughs> Cookie Boy also said on that other chart, now do net with properties and shares. Yeah, that's quite uh, interesting, isn't it? terms of the way to think about it. Now, um, Jerry made this comp, com which I just wanted to touch on. Is it just me? But if banks have a 10% default, that would bring down the banks and cause bank collapses. Yeah, it certainly would. But the default rates are not going to be anything like that, not least because of what I said earlier on about the ability of banks to be able to extend and pretend. Um, the default rates are still quite low at the moment, although higher. Although if you look at some of the non-bank lending and if you look at some of the subprime lending, those rates are quite a lot higher. So 
it is going to be a question of how this plays out. And I suspect that that RBA discussion I had earlier on about how they're going to actually do the management of the economy ahead will have a significant impact on the default rates and things like that too. And for me, the bottom line is this. If the employment rate stays low and if people can earn the income that they want, they will be able to muddle through. It'll be painful. A lot of people will have to make significant compromises about where they spend the money and will probably not have much in the way of spending power. But that doesn't mean they're going to default in their mortgage because people tend to prioritise the mortgage or the rent over other expenditures. But they might give up on home insurance, for example. I discussed that with everyone yesterday. Or they might give up on health cover. Or they might give up on the quality of food they buy. So we're seeing some of these pressures amongst households. Now, a lot of that pressure is amongst younger households, first-time buyers. A lot of that pressure is also from young investors. I mentioned earlier on that a lot of the millennials are now into investment property, but the stress levels amongst millennials is really, really high for investment property. That's because they're not buying smartly, unfortunately. So that's another factor to bear in mind. It is a question of being cautious and careful at the moment with what's going on. Now, maybe interest rates will come down, but the inflation rate is likely to remain sticky for some time. We've got pressure on um, petrol prices again at the moment, of course. And I saw that uh, people are now talking about importing gas into Australia to meet the gas demand for next winter, which I think is incredible. So a lot of unknown unknowns. So the bottom line is this. We are in a very precarious situation at the moment. This is going to be a story this is going to play out over months and years, not weeks. The reason why default rates are so low is because people are still managing to muddle through. The economy is still slowing at the moment rather than accelerating. I do expect unemployment rates to rise. I do expect the Reserve Bank ultimately to cut rates, but it will be sometime later. And all of that means that we're going to see more households in more difficulty for longer. And, you know, there is a bit of a sense of, well, you know, how is it going to play out? And I guess the question is relevant in other countries too. The banks will come under more pressure ahead. The term funding facility will disappear. That's a very cheap money from the RBA. That means the banks will have to raise more funds. Now, how much in the way of funds they will have to raise will be determined a bit what the RBA does. We also know that in some cases, the deposit rates that banks have been offering have come back. Now, they've moved up a little bit because the bond rates have moved up, but deposit rates are being squeezed. Credit card interest rates are going up in some cases. And as I mentioned earlier on, the interest-only days are definitely uh, moving, as Cookie says, from 55 to 44 days. Yep, seeing that quite clearly. And um, as Cookie Boy also said, of course, the US commercial, in other words, commercial property, is also in a significant world of pain. That's going to be a leading indicator. And of course, a lot of banks in Australia have some property exposure directly and also indirectly. So I guess the lasting thought I want to leave you with is that taking ownership of your own finances is a critical capability that people need to, I think, learn at the moment because there are no simple solutions. Now, just before I close out, let me just make the point, if you want more information about what we do and what the world and what the world funds, because we have a collaboration with Nucleus Wealth, you can go to the What the World Fund. If you go to my blog, digitalfinanceanalytics.com blog, you can get all the information there. All my posts are there and also contact me directly. If you want to get information about the postcodes, you can also subscribe via Patreon. There I have different levels of subscription. If you would like to support me on via Patreon, there are various levels of membership. But at the 50 US dollar a month level, you can get the full data set for the postcodes. And that includes more than 2000 postcodes. It's updated every month that you're subscribed. And also, by the way, if you uh, would like to support me, you can do that via PayPal. I always appreciate that. Um, we don't do this for profit. We do this because there's a costs involved, of course, and we think there's a really important story to tell. So always great. To see. Or indeed, I still do a Bitcoin. So that is always another way of supporting me. So as I come to the end of the show, I want to say thank you very much for uh, uh, spending some time with me this evening. Um, cookie asked, uh, before you go, <laughs> thoughts on US inflation data tomorrow? I think it'll be higher than people expect. 
I think that the services inflation X housing will be higher. And the truth of the matter is that there is always a question about how accurate the inflation data is anyway. So we'll see. I'll make a separate show about that to probably after the information has come out. Um, as I was saying, if you want the data that I showed for that particular set of postcodes, um, if you want the data for one postcode, you can email me directly via the DFA blog and I can send you over the next few days the screenshot, the one page picture of the postcode. Now, I can't do it if you give me a long list. It's just too much work. But I do always offer that if you'd like a particular postcode, contact me via the blog and I'll send it to you. There's no cost involved in, in doing that. And uh, as Alison says, flick me an email. Um, Thea says, good night, everybody. Great show. Thank you for that. And uh, Cookie says we could see a four. We could indeed see a four. We'll see. You know, it's interesting. The last two months in the US have been all over the place in terms of what was uh, expected. Now, in terms of next week, um, let me make the point that uh, there will be another show, normal time, and uh, Leith Van Onselen will be on. Of course, Leith of It's All About Migration, fame, macro business economist will be there. And uh, that'll be, I think, a good show. And then in the coming weeks, I've got Robbie Barwick coming on. And in a few weeks, I've got Steve Keen coming back on again and a few other guests as, too, as well. So keep an eye out for those notifications. Um, we plan to do these live streams each Tuesday at 8 p.m., despite the time change. I'll continue to make my other recorded shows through the week. And I would ask you please to like and subscribe and share these posts and turn on notification if you want to be notified of future shows. Um, there are some really important conversations ahead. I think that there's a level of uncertainty in the economy at the moment for the reasons we've been discussing. So this is an important time to get informed and keep informed. And I try to provide hopefully balanced, but also relevant insights and information. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. I have a doggy. I don't know where Meteor's gone. She's over there under the lights. But there's me, there's Luna, who has been quite good. And uh, I'm pleased to say that she's still asleep. But I guess she'll probably wake up when I get up and want another walk. Anyway, there's Luna, the Kelpie, looking as though she owns the place. So with that, thank you very much. Take care. Have a good week. I hope you dry out if you had um, rain through the last few days, and I hope the next few days will be less rainy, and I look forward to seeing you next time. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.